Hello, my name is Rosalind Price Cousins and I'm one of the Craft Business Skills Coordinators here at the Crafts Council and we're very lucky today to have Karen Thompson here who's going to be sharing her experience in setting up and running her craft business. Um, Karen Thompson is a ceramic artist, illustrator and teacher so she's got quite an extensive um, experience behind her. So I'm going to hand over to Karen now and then at the end um, we'll have a bit of time for some questions and answers. Just... Brilliant. Thank you very much, Rosie. Thank you. That's all right. I'll just get rid of this page. <laughs> okay. And I can share my screen. So I'll just share my screen, which is this one. Um, share. There you go. Okay. Um, so uh, um, I'll just oh, hold on get the slideshow going. So this is a little bit about myself. Uh, I was born in the Northeast. Um, I have, um, I started, I started at Ceramics quite late. I was 30 year old um, when I started uh, studying and I started at uh, Kensington and Chelsea College in London on evening classes. And then I completed uh, um, a BA in Ceramics from uh, Bath Spa University. Um, I my work has become quite political, um, and it, it frequently has historical references which I uh, subvert. Um, I'll talk a little bit about my work a little bit more. I'll touch on my work a little bit more as we go along. I'm going to try and go in a bit of a chronological order today as to how my um, practice has been formed and taken shape. Um, so the first thing is my website. Um, uh, I think it's very important to have a obviously a web presence. Um, um, this is some of my work. I work um, across uh, disciplines. I do a lot of drawing, um, painting. Um, I work um, politically um, in installation work, and I also. Um, make homewares and, and things like that, um, which I sell. So we'll move on to the next slide. I've also got um, social media accounts at Twitter and Instagram. Um, I don't have huge amounts of followers, but I, I think it's quite a nice thing to maintain. And I also have a blog on my website. Um, so I started off making homewares at Kensington and Chelsea College. Um, the first project we had was teapots and then I became known as a teapot lady um, and then we as I progressed uh, into my BA um, the second year I was making bowls um, and then we by the time I got into the third year I felt that my work wanted to move into a different direction so it was at that point and um, I started to become slightly more political in my work more social commentary um, and this was some work I completed for my um, BA degree. Um, this was, we were very lucky to um, have an exhibition in the Holborn Museum of Art in Bath. And um, that uh, was uh, both, uh, my, my work was installed both inside and outside. So this is my QWERTY installation. Um, at the time, it was the beginning of a change in the way I was uh, working, as I, as I said, and I was quite fascinated with um, the way we communicate, the methods of communication and how we become very reliant on computers. And at this point, people were having quite intense relationships and um, was pre, pre kind of dating apps and um, uh, well, around the time of, of the dating apps, but not so much on your phone, more on your computer. Um, and I was interested in the, how we could have quite intense relationships with this. And the only tactility within this was your keyboard. Um, and I was interested with that relationship, you know, how we've kind of formed that. So I literally just started by taking computer keyboard apart um, and then that progressed into a um, complete installation. So at the bottom, I don't know whether you can see um, my cursor, but at the bottom, this bottom right hand piece is called Retro Keyboard, um, where I've, I've kind of merged those elements of um, 
clay being used um, historically to record information and um, now how we are using plastic. And the same with this piece of the top, it's called, you know, it's Morse code, it spells out the medium is the message. Um, and those were clay keys, computer keys that I made. And the central piece there is a cuneiform tablet, which was um, created using the underside of computer keys pushed into the clay. And that um, for me was referencing the way we communicate now. It's th that motion of pushing to record information. We push a key to record our knowledge now where um, historically we would have pushed a read into a bit of clay uh, to create cuneiform. And it, it is very much looks hieroglyphic, that piece, and I saw just fired it. Um, these are some other pieces that were created for that installation. Uh, the top left is a piece called Meltdown, where I started to mix medium together. So I took a computer keyboard, which was plastic. I made the porcelain keys. I pre-fired them and then I put them onto the keyboard, took the old keys off, put the lay the porcelain ones on and then fired it back in the kiln at a very low temperature. Um, the piece on the right is called Clicking With You, which um, is that reference of making a connection with somebody via, um, via uh, AI, really. And the back of this in the background, these are all the circuit boards which I took from the keyboards. Um, this next piece, this, this is an installation of the work uh, in the Holborn in, in, in Bath. Uh, unfortunately, I don't have a larger area of um, to show you the full exhibition um, with everybody else's work because I've suffered a terminal hard drive and I've lost um, quite a bit of work. So that's a piece of advice I would give to everybody is, um, this was an external hard drive, which was backed up, um, but to back your work up twice <laughs> so, um, and the other thing about this is if you're doing your degree show, it's try as a group, you have, I think you have more power as a group to try to um, get to show your work in larger venues um, and, and, you know, really try and approach people as well. This was work I installed outside. This was a piece called Fragile. It, um, it had about 300 PMN2 landmines, which I made. Um, uh, which is at the top right hand corner here. Um, I, um, I got in touch with a landmine company, and uh, uh, sorry, a landmine charity, um, no more landmines at the time. And they sent me um, a photograph of some, of uh, an image of some PMN, of, of some different landmines really, a very variety. And I chose the PMN2 landmine um, because I thought it just had that an urn-like feel and I liked the cross on the top I thought and um, I thought yeah almost to me referenced the cemetery that cross and that's exactly how I laid it out on the left and um, I've laid it out to look like a military cemetery so they were all aligned at about a meter distance maybe slightly less um, uh, and I made these little signs to go within the installation uh, that was a, that was there for a few weeks, maybe about three weeks, three or four weeks, and it was quite interesting to see the uh, difference in or how it, the insulation changed within the time period as well. You know, the grass kind of grew around, and um, some of the landmines were smashed, which was quite interesting. But um, for me, it's that that play on space and you know landmines and how a lot of people weren't walking through that area. It was a very popular area to walk through and a lot of people weren't walking through that area because of the fragility of the work. Whereas, you know, in the juxtaposition would be in reality that you wouldn't walk through that area for fear of death or limb loss. Anyway, so then I took the PMN2 because I was fascinated that people didn't recognize the object. Um, and then I made them into, um, trinket boxes and decorated them with traditional um, Bailey's decals, floral decals, um, and I sell those in craft shows now. Um, so um, after I graduated um, uh, a little bit about a, a little bit later, I started looking for other opportunities and um, then I started to look a lot at the Arts Council England um, 
jobs pages and alternative sites and um, curator space is a good site to look for opportunities that wasn't available at that point but uh, it's worth regularly checking now an art quest um, there's several craft council website there's several uh, websites that you can look at to um come across opportunities and one opportunity i did come across was for uh, crescent arts um, so crescent arts is a um uh, it's funded by the arts council um, it's an NPO, uh, National Portfolio Organisation, and it's a, 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 a subsidised studio space um, for early onset artists. Um, uh, it's in Scarborough, and um, I applied to, I was living in London, and I applied to um, come to Scarborough to uh, have a, a studio residency. Um, that lasted five years. Um, I think at the time they were heavily subsidised. I think I paid about forty-five pounds a month for rent for the studio. Uh, there was a kiln in the studio, so I got all of my kiln firings free, and uh, I also got about two hundred pounds a year in professional development money. So it was a very supportive environment. There was about six studio spaces, at, uh, so uh, enough for six artists. Um, so one of the first, I've, uh, I've, I've never been to Scarborough before, I've never been to Scarborough before, I wasn't familiar with Scarborough, and one of the first connections I made was with Scarborough Museums Trust and Scarborough Art Gallery, and Scarborough Art Gallery invited me to um, a late they were having in the gallery, and they invited me to be a portrait artist for the evening, so, um, so I... <laughs> sat at a little table and um, drew people who came in and uh, they got to take their portraits home at the end it was quite terrifying and um, uh, yeah yeah I uh, kind of had to put a little proviso that you know I couldn't be held responsible for the outcome of the drawings um, but that was really great fun and from that then that led on to me being commissioned by Scarborough Museums Trust to make a piece of artwork um, with and for uh, their Cultivate youth group. And it was to go into the Fears, Foes and Fairies exhibition, um, which at the time had cultural Olympiad um, funding. So these, this picture on the bottom left of, are some little mini heads that were made in uh, workshops that I ran. This was just one little series. There was a few series. Um, and then I created a charmology head. So we were looking, the, the exhibition Fears, Foes and Fairies was predominantly looking at the work of a Victorian charm collector um, who had collected amulets and things like that. And we were looking at the health charms. And so I started to think that that Victorian science of health and ambulance, amulets. And then it led me to think about phrenology heads, um, which were probably in the same era. And I made a charmology head. So all of these, this writing, all of these labels were um, the labels that were written by William Clark that I scanned in and got made into uh, decals and applied. And I made two heads, um, for, uh, when I was working on this project uh, in case anything happened to one. So as a ceramicist, it's always quite good to have a backup. And the um, Scarborough Museum's Trust chose the uh, pink chromology head. Um, and that picture is of um, Shirley Collier, who was CEO at the time. Uh, and that's the work installed within uh, the exhibition. Um, so when I made those heads, so then I, I had a basic mould for a head and that led me on to start to make the, this next series of work, which was, the, which was Turin heads. So again, inspired by Victorian culture, um, we had the phrenology, we had the amulet collecting, and I was also fascinated at the time by the large Victorian tureens, like serving dishes, where you would have elaborate swans or boar heads, and uh, I was quite interested in doing a contemporary take on that. So I made a human head 
um, and you know you would lift the head off and the you know I've made a base in the bo in the bottom of the chain so um, and I just envisage you opening it up and finding a selection of peas or cauliflower um, some brain like formula. <laughs> When I was at Crescent Arts, part of that residency as well was also to have an exhibition. Um, so I, uh, because I was living rurally uh, or more towards the countryside, I was starting to become um, fascinated with um, the food chain, our farming process. Um, and I made an installation uh, called Farm World. So this piece in the picture is a piece called Earth to Earth. I've started again to mix more media. I've got um, these plastic toys which were bought. Um, I've got dead honeybees. The ceramic barrel, uh, porcelain barrel, is a chemical barrel to reference, you know, how we've become toxic. Instead of a natural kind of um, elements, we're putting on chemicals. And then I've melted again, melted down everything in the kiln to so the tires all melted. Um, to show um, mm. the corrosive pollution, polluting ele elements. Um, this was, I wonder if I can move this over so you can see a little bit better. This um, was an installation shot. So I had a, uh, got the photograph made very large. I've made this ceramic figure called the GM Reaper. Uh, so he was commenting on genetically modified crops. Um, and um, he's uh, ceramic earthenware using under glaze colours to make him look plasticky. Um, and yes, uh, so he's my Grim Reaper. And the top piece was a piece called uh, The Human Milk Cow. And that was at the time referencing an article I'd come across where Chinese scientists have genetically modified cows to produce human milk. Um, and I, I thought I quite liked the well the Staffordshire cow is a very familiar object um, so it seemed natural to lend itself to um, being produced uh, uh, to reference Staffordshire Staffordshire pottery um, and th that only stayed as a drawing um, this piece is called human um, a poultry life and it's taking the um, chicken egg nest holders and subverting them because that's quite a romantic vision of egg production so I've de-beaked them I cut the beaks off them all I took a I made a mold of an original piece and then I cast um some in earthenware um and I yeah I de-beaked them I pushed them into chicken wire and I didn't glaze them because I thought it was quite interesting the texture of them not being glazed um and I displayed them on a set of shelves, um, which to me were a cross between supermarket shelves and uh, battery cages. And um, whilst I was also at Crescent Arts, so this residency was um, a great way to network um, because there was professional development opportunities. One of the opportunities was um, the artist Bob and Roberta Smith, um, connected with Crescent Arts and uh, between us we really formed the Art Party Conference so that was in 2013 at Scarborough Spa and the piece I it was um it was a, a, a political party to protest um Michael Gove the then Secretary of State for Education his plans to take uh, craft and art out of the national curriculum. So the piece that I proposed making and thought about making was a piece called The Gove Shy. Um, as we're in a seaside resort, Scarborough, there's a lot of um, amusement arcades on the seafront. And I just thought I would reference that kind of um, culture um, within the work. So I, I envisaged this big wooden shy that I would build and the little busts I thought wouldn't it be great if I could get those made from Wedgwood clay because Wedgwood clay is synonymous with uh, the history of art and culture well culture really and um, craft sorry um, within the UK so um, so I approached 
uh, Wedgwood to ask if they would donate some clay. Uh, I, when I um, started that process, I didn't think I would be successful because it was such a political piece. Um, but I thought I'm going to try anyway. So that's advice I would give to anybody is, you know, what harm is there in trying? Even if you don't think you're going to be successful, give it a go anyway, you just don't know the outcome. And so they actually did. They donated an in-kind donation of Jasper Ware casting slip. Um, and I made uh, the Gove Shire with that. So I made little busts of Michael Gove. Um, there was three hundred less than 300 made and uh, a large wooden shy. And on the day of the art party conference, we used wooden balls and we um, <laughs> smashed up the busts of Michael Gove. Um, and there was also at the time, uh, Tim Newton, film director Tim Newton and um, Bob and Roberta Smith were making, made a film um, in tandem, uh, part documentary, uh, part film and at the bottom right there's uh, the main actors um, Julia Rayner and John Vos. Um, John Vos played Michael Grove and Julia, Julia Rayner played uh, Nettie Hettleship, her, his uh, long-suffering secretary. Um, and from that I also got my first front page cover of a magazine which was the um, Skinny magazine. Um, uh, around this time, my work developed and I was uh, spending a lot more time making large paintings. These two in the middle were made around the time of the art party conference, in fact, the same week. And I found a great release from the technical kind of making of the Govshai. Go you know, uh, it's, it's it, these were quite free flowing and you know I just didn't know what I was going to make when I went to the easel and very quick to make very abstract um, and yeah quite a contrast to the process of making ceramics um, so I still make those now they're another income stream for my work and uh, I have never really promoted them in a large way but they seem to be creeping in popularity, people are finding out about them and approaching me to buy some. So the biggest and hardest thing for me within that respect is letting go of them because I've become quite um, attached to them. And um, yeah, I, I feel reluctant to let them go, which I'm making conscious effort to um, get better at and, and just to let them out there. Um, so these also inspired some uh, workshops at Scarborough Art Gallery. This was starting to become uh, a, a source of income for me and um, it started with the first workshops that I um, uh, did with Scarborough Museums Trust when I was making Charmology Head um, and also I was running workshops at Crescent Arts within that residency at Crescent Arts as well there was opportunities to be paid for invigilating the exhibitions so we had an exhibition space uh, within the gallery uh, within the premises and um, we would be paid to invigilate and um, set up, install the exhibitions and to run workshops. <clears throat> so this was an exhibition I was uh, selected for. This was uh, Craft Council and uh, Berwick Visual Arts. Um, I had these, it was a, a socially conscious craft uh, exhibition and it was from work within the uh, Craft Council collection, but they also put an open call out uh, for work to be made. Um, I saw the um, advert, I think this came from a, uh, the Arts Jobs um, website, and uh, I just resonated very deeply with this exhibition, but unfortunately I wasn't eligible um, because it specifically says here, we're looking for two designers and makers from Northumberland to create new work responding to the theme of socially conscious craft. Um, I wasn't living in Northumberland at the time. I was, um, I'm was. i based in North Yorkshire, um, but also I have connections with Tyne and Weir and spend a lot of time in Tyne and Weir. So I cheekily thought I would email um, Berwick Visual Arts and um, express my interest. So I did send an application and um, I did say also when I sent the application, I, I wasn't eligible. I didn't live within Northumberland. Um, I had looked at a historical map and the boundary of Northumberland used to um, 
contain tannin weir so I did ask if that still applied and they got back to me to say unfortunately because of the way it's funded that they couldn't accept applications outside of Northumberland but if there were uh, other opportunities they would let me know and um, so that's it was great for me to put myself on the radar and show enthusiasm and then they did put a second call out and in this call out they extended the boundary to uh, include Tyne and Weir at County Durham, Teesside. So this, and, and also they asked for work which had already been produced instead of creating new work. Um, so I applied and um, I'd already created the Three Tigers, uh, again, referencing Staff Chipotle, it's a piece of work called the Trilogy of Death. And um, the top piece here is a copy of the Staff piece of Pottery from 1800s. Um, the death is called the death of Monroe and I've taken the death of Monroe I've made a copy of them and I've used the same elements of the man the tiger and the base to convey two political socially conscious uh, stories now the first on the below on the bottom left is the um the, it's the death of Sainsbury's and that's commenting on the food chain uh, because in its essence the death of Monroe is is a tiger having its lunch so you know we are heavily reliant as culture on supermarkets as part of the food chain and um, become very removed from from the natural process so that for me was a comment if we sourced our food in a natural way it would be the end of the supermarkets domain over us and the bottom right piece is called the death of a species uh, where the the man has had little slight changes now holding a pipe he's got slippers and and that's his hunting trophy so um and obviously we're pushing uh, some subs well some sub subspecies of tiger are already extinct but we're pushing the tiger to extinction and i was invited to talk at the uh, opening of the exhibition as well which was fantastic um and that was at the granary gallery in berwick um, and um, some fantastic other artists from the collection who were um, on display and also Doug Jones uh, who's contemporary London-based artist uh, he talked about his work as well. So that was my first connection and putting myself really on the Craft Council radar as well uh, who then went on to uh, help champion my work a little bit. This was a so project I was working on the left was some porcelain sandwiches um, and then the right, the tigers. I'd also taken that uh, that full tiger project and then made these little um, called curious, curious, uh, curious curiosities and I made them into little tiger jars so you could keep your little Victorian ordnance in. Um, and they also... Uh, also my head. Um, so this was the project I was next worked on. So this was for York Curiouser. Uh, it was funded. I found out about this project from local networking, uh, which was great to do at Crescent Arts, but um, just, yeah, just any networking opportunities. Um, and I found out about the exhibition and I applied. I already had the idea hovering in the back of my head to make some porcelain sandwiches because I quite like the surreal elements and you know living in Scarborough you'd frequently by the sea you know in my head I'd associated it with knotted hankies and sandwiches so I really wanted to make the sandwiches out of white to make it look like white bread um uh, flat white bread and it also fitted with being in York as well because I think that's you know a kind of a tourist destination and everybody again the packed lunches go in and um, so that was fantastic it was 300 again 300 sandwiches were made out of porcelain I made cheese sandwiches egg mayonnaise and cucumber and they were displayed within York at different venues one of the venues was the treasurer's house uh, which is a national national trust property and they were placed in the gardens there uh, they were also in Yorkshire museum gardens uh, on the York walls um, in King's Manor uh, and I did an artist's talk as well as uh, part of the festival of ideas around that project um, which uh, uh, was great so I got some great uh, feedback from that exhibition at the talk as well it was great because there's a couple of ladies who had brought me the sandwiches which they picked up and then decorated so 
kind of brought them and, and gave me to them in the uh, artist talk, which was quite nice to have that uh, interaction. Uh, so even though I had my studio at res uh, residency with Crescent Art, I was also able to apply for other residencies. Um, so I applied to the AA2A scheme, which is Artists Access to Art Colleges. Um, and I've applied uh, on two separate occasions to the AA2A scheme. The first time I applied was uh, to Harrogate College. And uh, what year was that? 2012. And then I reapplied again in 2015. Uh, when I saw um, an opportunity come up with uh, York Art Gallery and York College. So this was an AA to A plus residency that they were trialling and that was to do an artist residency within York Art Gallery at York Art Gallery, but to use the facilities of York College. One of the pieces I made while I was there was um, a piece called the Fiona Green Charger. So this is Fiona Green on the right who was um, uh, working with the collections, she was kind of keeper of the collections, and um, uh, that was her at her desk <laughs> within the stores. And um, this was a plate, uh, this Queen Anne charger on the left, um, uh, which was within the collection, which I found fascinating. So I subverted it and made the Fiona Green charger. So these uh, three elements that um, are predominant within the Queen Anne. Uh, Queen, uh, yeah, Anne Charger, or the crown, which in the Fiona Green Charger became a Thomas Toft Tig, which is probably one of the most important pieces they have in their collection, the real crowning glory. Um, and this uh, orb was uh, a rasp meat. Uh, <laughs> yeah, was in their collections. And then there was the Wedgwood um, uh, a staff kind of thing. So. Uh, <laughs> then from that uh, connection, I um, uh, had work within the collections. They took some of the Michael Gold busts um, into their collections. So this was great. And at around the same time as well, the Craft Council um, took into their collections the um, Michael Gold busts and also the, um, the porcelain sandwiches into their handling collection. Um, so again, I was trying to branch out. I've started to approach galleries that were kind of based in the Northeast. There's 108 Fine Art in Harrogate, uh, who are a great gallery. They've moved from this building now um, and uh, have a spectacular, huge house. And um, uh, I had a, had a solo exhibition with 108. Um, the Biscuit Factory in Newcastle, Pineapple Gallery in Bishop Auckland. These are all galleries. So, and these, um, you know you can you can approach these galleries fairly easily um also craft fairs i've kind of tried to maintain a presence at craft fairs and craft stalls art fairs and um, this one's in newcastle at town center uh, next to the monument um, it's an art fair they have um in autumn and spring which i love doing um I also make, as another source of income, uh, these ceramic brooches, um, which are made just with little offcuts of clay. This has helped me out financially uh, on several occasions. Um, that uh, Coca, the Coca Galleries, which is the art galleries in York Art Galleries, the ceramic specific ceramic galleries, they have a shop, and they took um, for several, for a couple of years, they stocked these brooches in the shop, and I sold hundreds of them so that was fantastic um also other shops you could look at are just different gallery shops i also approached the approached the national glass center shop and made a connection there um, and uh, they promoted my work as well and also uh, they offered me uh, showcases so i had two showcases with the national glass center which was great so within this work i had my two heads um, Gove bus, PMN2 landmines, eyeball vases, um, and they've been really supportive as well. Um, also to have a shop on my website, I, I didn't have a shop initially, but now I have a shop within my website, um, which has helped greatly. Um, and to also have, um, to increase that social media profile. So this was with the Crafts Council directory. Um, and from having a page, from taking a page on the directory, uh, I got an exhibition 
with work with the University of Essex workspace pressure, um, which was fantastic. And also I got um, a phone call from um, Lady Frances Sorrell, who uh, is from the Sorrell Foundation, uh, inviting me to do to uh, um, de uh, deliver a masterclass for the National Saturday Club Trust, which was um, I felt it was a real privilege. That was a beautiful experience. Uh, and they both, both of those came directly from having Craft Council uh, directory page. Um, and there's some great Illuminati from the master classes as well. Uh, this, my teaching was con is been continuing um, and became more and more um, time consuming and predominant with the direction I was taking. Um, I was starting to work with different museums, trusts, um, Barnsley Museums, Scarborough Museums, York Museums, um, uh, um, councils. So this was really growing. Um, this is a workshop I ran in the beautiful Cannon Hall um, main room, which they wouldn't allow now, uh, but at the time we got away with running a fantastic ceramic workshop there. Um, so those are a couple of the little projects. Um, and I, I was working more and more for Scarborough Museums Trust uh, and I was invited to um, work at the Big Draw. This was the third year around uh, the Big Draw. The other years were 2010 and 2012. And in 2016, I spent a month working with primary school children in Scarborough and um, going around doing one hour illustration sessions based on Quinton Blake. Um, and this was an amazing exhibition. Uh, as an artist, I had people approaching me all of the time saying that, feed, giving me feedback about the standard of the work they felt was just absolutely exceptional. and. You know, I, I thought it was, there was some amazing work within that uh, exhibition. So it was, uh, yeah, it was great to kind of feel that I'd inspired the children to produce such uh, marvellous work. So my residency with Crescent Arts ended and I rented a studio on the pier in Scarborough from the council. So this is my studio, uh, the ones with the red tables outside. There are only small office spaces, but on this full stretch uh, on the balcony um, is all uh, rented by artists. So for as much as I'm renting an independent studio space, I still feel there's the connection uh, with artists, which I think is really important. Um, because I think you can lose yourself a little bit when you become isolated as an artist. It's nice to have interaction and feedback and the networking opportunities. So this is the view, the back view from my studio. Um, and this is my rather packed studio space, uh, which I'm able to run workshops from um, also, and, as, as, and also make work. The, the only hindrance I have within this space is I don't have a kiln um, and it's too small and too wooden to put a kiln in. So that's been a problem for me as a maker. Um, I also connected with uh, Make More Art, who are uh, an arts provider in Rydale, um, and I've done a lot of work. This, these were some um, land art sessions we ran for Rydale Council, but I've done a lot of work for Make More Art. They've had Arts Council funding for uh, a couple of projects which I've been involved with um, and I've got some work coming up as well with uh, Selby Council. and. Um, Rydale Council as well. I applied for a job I saw advertised in Scarborough Hospital uh, running uh, freelance workshops um, within the stroke unit. I'd never done any work in that environment but I felt drawn to um, apply. Uh, I'd worked a lot with um, children and vulnerable adults um, so I applied. They were um, they were it was from a period from October 2019 to I think March 2020, and it was a set number of workshops they had funding for. Um, and I just thought it was a fantastic experience. I gained a lot from that experience. Um, and then after I left there, um, uh, probably three or four months later, um, one of the arts team left, uh, who was full time, left um, the York Teaching Hospitals, and they advertised the job as a part time role. Um, across two sites 
Um, so I applied for the position of part-time art and design project officer for the NHS. Um, and I got that job, which is two days a week. Um, so that's, um, again, become an important source of income. Um, and that takes us to the last page now. So that's where we are now. Um, I work two days a week. I'm still running the workshops, although they have been affected by COVID. Um, and I'm still making work, although not as much ceramic as I would like to make due to um, the problems with accessing a kiln. So my new idea is uh, this fan, which I've just purchased and um, I'm going to transform into a mobile studio and workshop space uh, so it's going to be a transformation and I haven't started work on it yet um, but you can the, the back of the van is very big you can stand up in it and it'll be quite interesting to be able to deliver more workshops outside instead of having to rely on my studio um, and to also have the mobile studio space where I could kind of go and work on projects and travel and work on projects. So that's where I am at the moment. Um, yes, stop the share, see where we are. Oh, thank you so much, Karen. That was really inspiring. I absolutely love the van. <laughs> yes. <laughs> I don't know what I've done. I'm thinking, is, was that a good idea? But um, yeah, I think yeah moving forward you've got to kind of think in different ways and I just I can really imagine making work in that space and just because my studio is quite small anyway so I'm used to kind of small workspace so but then on a nice day we can just take a table and set it up outside and create yeah. anything really so that's such a lovely idea that kind of brings me on to um one of my first questions because this might be in in reaction to the last year because yes. last year has been such a uh, very like difficult and strange one for so many people and makers haven't been able to sell their work in galleries and you know markets like you were saying you, you like to do that market haven't been open um so people have had to kind of change their habits quite a lot and I just wondered yes. how you've kind of adapted in your creative business yes well, I think I've been very fortunate within the lockdowns. I did get the hospital job. So that has given me those two days. It's only two days, but it's given me a slight amount of stability. So I'm very fortunate for that. And um, I've been making more paintings and I've sold quite a few paintings. Um, and yeah, I think um, having more of an online presence, it pushes everybody to have more of an online presence, I think. Um, but I definitely have been affected by. Uh, the lockdowns as everybody has um yeah um did you do any um online kind of digital craft fairs or anything like that or uh, I did one in Newcastle but not no I haven't I haven't done very many of them um um because I haven't been able to make as much craft as I would like my craft stock is quite low at the moment so that's why I've kind of been focusing more on the paintings yeah. so moving forward that's really integral for me to have easier access to a kiln again um, yeah. so I've been actually looking for funding I've put in a couple of funding applications just to different prizes I think recently there was the Dover prize which was based up here and I applied for one and a half thousand just to see if I could buy a second hand kiln, but I, I didn't get that. Um, but, you know, so it's trying for those little opportunities where you can find a small amount, you know, maybe a thousand, a thousand and a half, two thousand to, to buy a kiln and install it somewhere. I think. Yeah. Um, so I've been doing quite a lot of that. I've, during the lockdowns, I've applied, as I think a lot of people have, because there seems to be all of these applications seem to be overwhelmed by applicants so I think a lot of people are doing that but that's you know it's a good way of accessing money is to apply for funding definitely and people have kind of had a bit more time to look out for opportunities and that kind of thing yes they have yeah 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 why not more. go for it and I love that bit yeah. of advice that you gave I was just wondering if there were any other kind of little nuggets that you could give to emerging makers that so I think the main thing I would say to emerging makers um, and this has been a hard lesson for me to learn, is, is not to take it personally, not to get upset if you don't, if you get rejected for something. Yeah. 
um, because I think, you know, I think I've grown quite a lot spiritually in the past few years. And when I started out, it really affected me. And um, I think now I see we're all on different paths. We're all on paths. And there's a lot to be learned from not getting an opportunity as well. There's a lot of personal growth you can get from not having something. So there's, there's, I believe there's like a reason sometimes if you don't get something, there, there's a little alternative reason and don't hold so tightly to that. Yeah, despondent, rejected. Yeah, the because, right time or the or yeah, the right absolutely, yeah. absolutely. So, but that can really affect artists. I think when they're setting up, because you go for everything and you don't get them, and then you kind of lose heart. And it's just and there's a reason why sometimes you don't get things. Yeah. And so. when you're making your your work is so personal to you, it's kind of putting yourself out there, isn't it? And so absolutely. it's really difficult to kind of detach and think, okay. It doesn't work for this particular thing, but maybe for something yes. else. It, it yes. Be. Yeah, precisely. And don't give up, you know, keep on applying for the things. It is time consuming to apply for things, but when you do get them, they are great and so rewarding. So, and you're not going to get everything every time because if everybody got everything every time, then there would be a lot of people who would never get anything ever. So, you know, there's like has to be a little rotational system where some people get things some of the times. <laughs> finding that one thing that connects with you so oh, yeah definitely um what else was I going to ask you um uh so emerging makers and then kind of looking back on your your career which has kind of had a lot of kind of twists and turns um yes is there anything you would do differently at all or there's quite a lot I would do differently <laughs> <laughs> in fact the majority of it. question isn't it it's like oh I wish I'd done that <laughs> yeah again not take things so personally but um yeah there's opportunities I wish I'd applied for and um, that I was a bit I wouldn't say lazy but a little bit kind of um in two minds and then I've let them kind of slate but I would I would have this this there's opportunity there's things that projects I should have done um Sometimes, you know, there was one project that I've tried to work on with uh, Berwick Visual Arts and we put in three Arts Council applications and I didn't get any of them. And that, for me, I almost felt like I'd done the project because I put that much work in finding match funding, planning it all, having me endless meetings with Berwick Visual Arts to kind of plan structure. And that work never came to fruition. And so for me, sometimes, although I've said apply for things, I think sometimes also, just just make the work as well you know because I that was one instance I regret because we could have done that project on such a low budget you know and I by that that process of applying three times to the Arts Council for funding and not getting any of them kind of was a hard challenge so yeah so on one breath I'm saying apply for things but the other breath I'm saying just do the work as well you know um, yeah if you put all that time and effort into it and have the kind of concept yes. then yes. You know, why not see it through for your own you know yes development yes. anyway so yeah I think that's fantastic advice and and lastly yes. I think we've just got time for one more question maybe um yeah. I was just wondering do you, you you did kind of mention that you do get less time for making now obviously due to various things and, and working part-time yes um but when you do how do you kind of make sure that you get that precious time um to create and make and obviously because your work's quite political do you often kind of get these amazing ideas but you don't quite have the time to to do them or yes yes i said well there's the two strands to my work there's the political work and then there's the craft work, which I've already kind of made, which I sell at fairs and things like that. Um, and so it depends what project I'm working on. I do get far more excited about working on a new project um, because I like that new thought process. Whereas the, the Turin heads, for instance, that's been a very steady source of income for me and they, they've had a lot of attention, but that's me recreating the same piece over and over and over again. And, you know, I kind of have ground to a bit of a halt with that. So when I've got a new project that I'm excited about and there's funding there, it's great just to kind of get on with it. And, you know, you just I think finding funding is a big thing because then you don't have to do as many workshops. Um, but that source of income has been, you know, really essential for me. Um, so, yeah, I think. Um, 
it's just as well setting yourself a day. I'm quite fortunate because I don't have a family really and children. So I have more me time than most people. So I, I can kind of... You can go in and spend a bit longer in the studio yeah. if you kind of get going on something you can go yes. in the night or... Yes. Yeah. And I do that quite frequently. Sometimes I it take a while to get started, but then when I'm started, I don't want to stop. So <laughs> it will be four o'clock in the morning and I'll look up and I'll be like, <gasps> you know, and... Um, <laughs> So I think a lot of, there's something about that, isn't there? There's the excitement of making and you get so absorbed in it that, you know, you don't want to disconnect from it. And yeah. I think for me, that's the biggest thing is pushing myself to start because sometimes you can, you can put off things and put off things. And, but once you've made that start, you just really instantly connect with it, um, which is really nice. So yeah, just getting in and starting leads to all sorts <laughs> I think you can kind of feel a bit overwhelmed can't you to begin with if you have an idea yes and your kind of final idea but it's that starting bit isn't it like where do I start to get there and obviously it's by the end it's going to be very different anyway isn't it that's always the yeah. process isn't it but to embark yes. on that journey it just you know you've got to start haven't you yeah and that's the other piece of advice I'll give to somebody because with that keyboard installation I did, that cuneiform tablet, which I thought was a great piece, um, I couldn't, I didn't conceive that piece. I didn't just sit with a piece of paper and think, oh, I'm going to do that piece. You know, that happened as part of the process of experimenting and just making. Right. And, you know, it was when I took the keys, it was actually because when I took the keys off, I thought I'm going to cast these keys to then make the keys to go on the retro keyboard and the meltdown piece. And so when I was casting, obviously you push the keys into a lump of clay to hold them while you make your mold and pour your plaster in. And when I took the plaster, when I took the, you know, plaster, pulled the plaster away and pulled some of the keys, I saw the imprint that that had left. So that piece was very much conceived as part of the making process, you know? And I think it's a, a really fantastic piece. In fact, I sent a photo of it to and um, the chap who reads cuneiform tablets in the British Museum and <laughs> he said the most fantastic response like what is this thing and um, yeah so that was quite a nice little reaction I think it's nice to do that as well to make those networking connections to you know if you think there's somebody out there I think it was Irvin Finkel was his name and you know I think it's fascinating that he translates all of these cuneiform tablets and um, he's real a master in his field and I just thought that was a really nice little thing to do to send him an email showing him a picture of it and yeah that's kind of a happy accident isn't it and sometimes yes. it that that can happen something can be yes. that you weren't expecting but it's actually yes. a really lovely piece it is I think and that's the other thing that can stop people is not people sometimes want a formulated finished idea in head before they start and they think oh I can't do that because I don't know where it's going whereas sometimes if you just make that engagement it can lead you, you know, via the process to some of the best ideas. And that's the great thing about craft and making, and especially ceramics, you know, you don't quite know when you start off. All of those accidents can lead to great things, whether it be something that goes wrong with the glaze or kind of part of the making process, it can really inspire lots of different ideas. That feels like a disaster at the time. Yeah, it does, you're in tears. <laughs> <laughs> yeah and then looking back on work frequently because there's some things that I made and they didn't come out as expected and you just kind of cast them to one side and if you don't throw them out 10 years later you pick them up and you look at them and you think oh wow and you see something in a very different light because you've lost that disappointment that it wasn't what you expected um, and then you can relook at that and and think ah but if I do this and then that can inspire different work so there I'm promoting people never to throw anything out <laughs> Keep it all, keep it all. <laughs> oh, fantastic. I think that's all probably we've got time for, but thank you so much for um, joining us today. This will be really, really inspiring for so many emerging makers to see kind of your career and, and how it's gone so far. And um, yes. yeah, thank you so much.